Christ Cathedral is the Cathedral of the Diocese of Orange, which used to be formerly known as Crystal Cathedral. Yes, built by Pastor Robert Schuller, Dr. Robert Schuller. You worked for him? You did? And you. Ah. Wow. I'm glad you worked for him and you're still a Catholic. Praise God. <laughs> okay, here is Father Brandon. Please welcome him. All right, we had to make sure that we were pressing play for the live stream for those of us that are at home. And so I'm hearing a little bit of feedback. I'm going to kind of move over this way a little bit. It's off. Yeah. Let's begin. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good and gracious God, we give you thanks and praise for the many blessings that you've given to us, especially the many blessings that you have shed upon your people, reminding them of your very presence with them, of how you accompanied them in the desert, of how you fed the multitude, and how you continually feed our hearts and our souls to be led on this journey of faith closer to you and to your son, Jesus, so that we will be able to inherit the kingdom. We ask, Heavenly Father, that as we have been praying and discerning over the Eucharist, as we have been talking and sharing about the miracles of how we as Catholics come to know the Eucharist as a source and summit of our faith, we ask, Heavenly Father, that you will send that gift of the Holy Spirit into our hearts to know you, to love you, and to serve you, to encounter you in the Eucharist, or we know that you are living and you come to nourish our very souls. And we ask, Heavenly Father, that tonight as we are going to discuss how the Eucharistic formula applies to our everyday lives, we ask, Father, that you will continually guide us. You will lead us and you will send us the wisdom of the Holy Spirit to enliven our hearts, to know you, to love you, and to serve you. And we ask all of this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. All right, so if I stand over here off to the side, I know that you may not be able to see me right here at the pillar. I will be moving back and forth. So it's okay, at one point you will all see me. And so tonight what I'd like to bring us to is to talk a little bit about the Old Testament, of how the Lord desired to be with his people. Too close to that one, I can't go over there. So the Lord, when he desired to be with his people, he said, I will be with you. I will be with you until the end of the age. We hear that Adam and Eve, in the creation and the perfection of the garden, God had established that he would give them everything that they would ever desire. And then he told them, I will give you everything that you will ever need. Everything that you will ever need is here in this garden. You will be satisfied. I will be with you. I will be your God. But the one thing I ask of you is not to eat of this one tree. And then, of course, we know that when you tell somebody not to do that, that's the only thing that we desire to do. Father Angelus tells me not to get dessert all the time. That's the only thing that I ever want. <laughs> and yet, when God told Adam and Eve, this tree, you can have everything that you will ever want, but this one thing I'm reserving for me right now because your hearts are not yet ready. Our relationship with one another is not yet ready ready for you to have that true wisdom and fullness of understanding. Because we know that the tree wasn't bad. After they had eaten it, they understood. It was for wisdom. It was for knowledge. But their hearts were not yet steadfast in that relationship with the Lord. And so that, from there, it was a woundedness that they had started to encounter because they may have had the fullness of understanding, but their relationship with the Lord was not yet as firm as it needed to be, where that understanding would be complete. And so then we go on to all of the multitude of generations that came after Adam and Eve. And we see how through all of Genesis, the Lord had been with his people. And he's saying, I'm going to establish a covenant with them. I will be with them. 
I will continue to be with you. And we know that Abraham, our father in faith, brought about that very covenant that I will bless you all from all of the nations and you will be a father to all the nations. And from you, many will be blessed. And from there, we see the Israelite people. The Israelite people, as we've been praying and reflecting over in the Mass the last two weeks, we heard about Joseph, a man that had been an Israelite that was left for dead because his brothers were envious of him. And then he goes to Egypt. And from Egypt, we see that the Lord had blessed him. He was no longer just a slave that was picked up in the middle of the desert, but instead he was Pharaoh's right-hand man. Joseph's brothers had come to him, and they were asking for grace. They were asking for a little bit of grain to be able to supply enough for them to be able to last in the famine. Joseph, he knew who his brother was. He knew who his brothers were that had come to meet him. And yet, they didn't recognize him because they had imagined that he was a little slave boy that was left off. And they were coming to meet the man who was second only to Pharaoh. And so he looks at his brothers and he says, I know you and I will provide everything that you need. We see a very human figure in Joseph, a good and just man who will provide for the needs of his brothers. And then at the very beginning of the account of Exodus, we hear of how the glory of Joseph, the Israelites, they prospered. And one of the very first lines in Exodus, and they forgot Joseph. It's not because they forgot him as an individual, but because the generations that had followed him, they had forgot about the Israelites, of how they were brothers to the Egyptians, but instead they were subjugated. They were called to be slaves, not as brothers, not as equals, but as subservience. And then we hear that Moses, the Lord appeared to him in a bush that was on fire but was not consumed. Today in our readings, we hear, I am who am. The Lord reveals his divine name to Moses and says, I am who am. Go to Pharaoh and let him know who I am. And we hear about the whole Exodus account of how the Lord had sent the plagues to show Pharaoh who he was. And then after the plagues, the Israelites were free. They were wandering in the desert. And at this very moment, where we begin our process of the Eucharistic cycle, of how the Lord chooses to nourish his people, it is right here after that Exodus account, after they have already left Egypt, after they are wandering in the desert, going towards the promised land that the Lord had given to them, that was leading them to that promised land. And so, we have them in the desert. They're complaining, they're grumbling, and they're saying, Lord, it would have been better if we would have left us in Egypt because then we would have had bread to eat. They were willing to take subjugation. They were willing to take on that act of being slaves because they had enough to eat. They were willing to allow their own dignity to be lessened because they had enough to eat. They were willing to say, I will do whatever they are asking me to do because I will have enough to eat. And so the Lord looks at them and he tells them, I am who am. I brought you out of Egypt. I brought you out of slavery. You are meant more than that. You are meant for more than that. If you are hungry, I will feed you. If you have a need, I will satisfy it. And so we hear that the Lord will provide bread for his people. After the grumbling and the complaining of his people, of saying, Lord, it would have been better if we would have died in Egypt, but then we would have had at least bread. And so God says, if, if that's what you're desiring, if that is what you need, I will provide it. And so the Lord, if he had spoken to Moses and he had said, I will give them bread to eat, but I will give you this instruction that they will only gather what they, what they need for the day. And if they gather more than that, it will spoil and so we see that the Israelites, as they're traveling through the desert, the Lord is providing for their very needs. He is giving them bread from heaven, the manna. And for many of us, we think about it, and we hear about the bread of heaven, and it's so wonderful. But in the original Hebrew, manna is like 
Mana? Mana? What is that? What is that? That's what mana means. What is that? Because they had no idea of what it was. There was a bread that the Lord had given to them. That yes, it had covered the earth. And they were called to go and gather. They were called to be there in his very presence among the tent of worship. And there they would gather enough of what they needed to satisfy their hunger, to satisfy that hunger that they had had, to nourish their bodies on this journey of faith to the promised land that the Lord was leading them to. And in there is a promise that every day I will provide for your very bodily needs. Know that I am the Lord God and I will give you everything that you will ever need. I will be with you. By day, I will cover you with cloud. By night, I will be pillars of fire that will lead you. And when you are hungry, I will give you the bread from heaven. I will send the quails into the campyard in the evening so that you will have flesh to eat. The Lord is providing for his people, even in the midst of their groaning, in the midst of their grumbling, in the midst of saying, Lord, it would have been better if we were slaves in Egypt and we would have died. The Lord says, you are more than that. You were made for much more than that because you are my people and I will satisfy all of your needs. And so day by day, it was a trust in the Lord and it was a promise from the Lord that I will give you exactly what you need. I will give you what you desire, but you have to trust me. You have to know that I am the Lord who will continually give you this gift that you received today and you will receive it again tomorrow because you can't gather enough for two days except on the Sabbath. It was an immense and deep trust in the Lord that the people had to know that the Lord would give them that bread from heaven, to give them the food that nourished them on their journey every single day. And the Lord was telling his people, I will always be with you. The tent of my presence is what you gather around to worship. The tent of my very presence is filled. And we know that Moses, as he would go into the tent to worship, we hear that his face would come out and it was dazzling because it was different, because he had seen the Lord face to face. And as they would go to this tent of worship, as they would go and they were nourished, led, continually led into the promised land, every day the Lord provided for their needs. When they were hungry, he fed them. When they were grumbling and when they were angry and they were tired, they were saying, I am still your God. I will still be with you. And I will continue to be with you until the end of the age. And that leads us up to that period of until the establishment of the temple in Jerusalem. Where there the Ark of the Covenant is brought in and that jar of manna, that jar of God's promise of giving you the food that you will need to sustain and to nourish you and your bodies. I will always be with you. I will care for you. I will care for your bodily functions. I will care that you are able to experience this nourishment that I have given you and trust in my promise that I will continually do it all over again. I don't know about you, but I have a little bit of a trust issue. I think it's common for all of us. It's hard for us to trust what we don't know. If all of a sudden I was in the middle of the desert and they told me, you can only take enough to eat for one day, <laughs> I would say, Lord, I had a whole, I had a camel full of food and we went through that in a couple of days. You're telling me to trust you and to know that you are gonna give me enough for tomorrow and the day after and the day after and the day after, I have to trust you. That must have been Im immensely hard. We read that in our scriptures and we kind of think about it. And it's like, oh my gosh, it's so wonderful. The people, they believed. They were nourished and they went through. But also we have to remember that the Israelites were real people. And just because they were thousands of years before us doesn't mean that they had doubts. 
but and yet they trusted that the Lord would be with them, that he would guide them, and that he would lead them. He would provide that food that would nourish them on their journey to the promised land. And as we get into the Gospels, so we're skipping ahead a little bit, in all four of our Gospel accounts, we see that the Lord is caring and nourishing his people. In the four different Gospel accounts, we have that the Lord feeds the multitude. But we see in the first account, the Lord is feeding 5,000. We hear that how many bread and how many fish are given to the Lord. So first, what's going on, and let's set the scene a little bit. The Lord has already manifested who he is to the world. He's already shown his signs and wonders that are showing who he is as the Messiah, that he is the one who has come into the world and is desiring to save it, that the Lord is the one who has come into the world and is desiring to show the people who he is, not by merely saying, I am the Messiah, I'm the one that you need to follow, but instead he's going to the wounded, the broken those that are in need of a father's care. Those that were blind and are made able to see. Those that were cast off as lepers and is saying, I am unclean, unclean, do not come near me. And the Lord enters into their presence and touches them and says, be made well. The Lord who has already manifested and who has shown who he is as the Lord, as the Messiah, as the one who will come to restore all things. A crowd is following him. And we know that it's more than 5,000, because it says 5,000 men. But we also remember that in our scriptures, it wouldn't have accounted for women or for children. And it's not because they were less than, it's just in that time period, they were not counted. And so if we could imagine, they would have brought their wives. So maybe there were 10,000 people. If they maybe brought their children, there could have been 11 or 12,000 people that were there. And so this multitude that is following the Lord, this multitude that is following him, all of a sudden, the Lord is teaching them. He's explaining to them about the glory of the kingdom. And then his apostles and the disciples are like, Jesus, it's getting a little bit late. Send these people home so that way they were able to go and feed themselves. Send them to the nearby villages so that they can go buy food. And the Lord, he looks particularly at Andrew, and he says, you feed them. You feed them. You give them food to eat. And then we hear the other apostles and the disciples are like, 200 denarii, 200 days wages is not enough to be able to give them enough food at all. And the Lord is setting the stage because he knows what he is going to do. He knows that immensely in his heart that he is going to satisfy the needs of the people that are gathered around him. That these 5,000, more than the 5,000, I will give them what they need in their body so that they can continue to follow me on the way of salvation. And so we hear that the Lord tells them, well, bring those five fish, excuse me, the five loaves and the two fish to me. We hear that he takes them, he blesses it, he breaks it, and it is given out. So it was a very long introduction. But tonight's topic, we're talking about take, bless, break, and give of how we apply that same Eucharistic formula that is used to this day, that we take the oblation of the people, the hosts that are offered to us at Mass. We bless them. We call down that gift of the Holy Spirit. We have already broken open the Word of God, and we call that the Holy Spirit comes and sanctifies this gift that it will be worthy to be the body, blood, soul, and divinity of His Son, Jesus Christ. And from there, it is given to each of us that we then can be nourished and go out into the world and be those little Christos that go out and change the world around us. But let's not get too far ahead. So here, as the Lord is setting the scene, as he's already encountering the multitude that is in front of him, he's saying, you feed them. You go out and feed them. And then when you realize that you can't do it, that's when I step in. I don't know about you, but sometimes there are tasks that are placed in front of me, and I think they're impossible. I think I could never do that. I couldn't even begin to fathom how to start. I'm afraid of failure sometimes. 
So because that fear of failure, it will stop me from even beginning. And to the Lord, he says, I will provide everything that you need, but you have to trust me. And so the apostles that were gathered around him, when they heard the word of the Lord, you give them something to eat. They were probably thinking, Lord, we can't. I have nothing to give them. And it's different in all four different accounts. We hear that those are brought from the gifts of the apostles, that there are the bread and the two fish. Then in another account, we see that there are just two fish and five loaves that are given to him, and that they are already there. Some are given from the people. But in John's gospel, it's a little bit more elongated. And so I invite you all right now to just close your eyes and reflect on the words that are spoken to you right now, okay? We're going to go through what's called a little bit of an Ignatian exercise. And in that Ignatian exercise, we're going to focus on the Gospel of John and this encounter with the Lord as he's feeding the multitude. Close your eyes, listen to the word, but picture yourself there. Picture yourself there. Are you one of the people that's experiencing this and seeing it from the sidelines? Are you one of the people that's intimately close and is able to hear the words of the Lord? You give them something to eat. And as we're praying through and as we're reflecting on this gospel of John, there we will be able to begin to encounter the Lord, begin to encounter this gift of ourselves that we are offering to him, to let it be broken and let it be transformed for the world. A large crowd kept following him because they saw the signs that he was doing for the sick. Jesus went up the mountain and sat there with his disciples. Now the Passover, the festival of the Jews, was near. When he looked up and saw a large crowd coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, Where are we to buy bread for these people to eat? He said this to test him, for he knew exactly what he was going to do. Philip answered him, Six months' wages was not enough to buy bread for each of them to get a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon's Peter, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they among so many people? Jesus said, Make the people sit down. Now there was a great deal of grass in that place. So they sat down, about 5,000 in all. Then Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated. So also the fish, as much as they wanted. When they were satisfied, he told his disciples, Gather up the fragments left over, so that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up, and from the fragments of the five barley loaves, left by those who had eaten, they filled twelve baskets. And so for the next 30 seconds, I just want us to reflect on what we heard. Again, the Lord had told them, we need to give them something to eat. And we hear that Andrew, he comes up and he says, this little boy has five loaves and two fish. And from that very gift, the Lord, he magnifies it so that all were filled and all were satisfied. Now, when I read that passage, I think of a reflection that I had read one time. I think of the reflection where this little boy, he was probably given a lunch by his mom. She probably said, go out, eat your food, and then come back. And this little boy, we don't know how old he is. He doesn't have a name. This little boy, he goes, and he's following the Lord. Who knows if he was a follower of him already? Who knew if he was kind of pulled into the crowd because everyone was going to this place and he was like, I'm excited to go. I don't know what's happening, but I'm going. 
We don't know who this little boy is. And yet we see from his gift to the Lord many were fed. And not only were many fed, his glory was shown to the people. I don't know about you, but sometimes you think about five loaves and two little fish. And it's not like a salmon filet that we'd be able to get at the fish fry. These fish were probably tiny. These bread loaves were probably like a dinner roll. I look at that and I'm thinking that may not even be a full meal for me sometimes. <laughs> and yet the Lord, he takes that small offering and he magnifies it. And in that magnification, he shows exactly who he is. He says, I will be the God who will provide for his people. I will give them what they need for their bodies to be strengthened. I will give them exactly what they need to be able to continue to follow me. That small gift, those loaves and that fish, was a very tiny gift in comparison to the 5,000 people that were waiting out there to be fed. The Lord, he invites us in our smallness, in our littleness, in all that we have to offer him. Because he will take that and he will transform it for his own glory, for the sanctification of the world. And so a lot of the times in our own lives, we may think, I don't have anything to offer. There are times that I show up at groups or there are times that I show up at different events and I think I have nothing to offer, so I'm just going to kind of stay here into the back. There are some times that I show up places and I think I feel really out of place. I have nothing to offer here. And yet that little bit that we have, that little bit that we can give to the Lord and ask him to transform it, to bless it, to break it, and to be given out into the world, he will take that small gift that we have to him and he will transform it for the glory of his name forever. We just have to have the faith and confidence like that little boy who probably went up with his little lunch bag and it said, Lord, I have this to give you. It's not a lot, but it's something. And I'm sure the Lord, he looked with such great compassion. He looked at this little boy who was offering him so much. Probably that was everything to him. That was probably the only food that he was going to have that day. And he says, Lord, if you're asking for food, here it is. Lord, if this is what you need right now, here it is. Lord, if this is what you were asking of me, here it is. And with such great faith, that little boy handed over everything that he had. And the Lord, he took that very small gift that may not have been enough for maybe one or two people. And for the glory of his own name, to show that he will continually provide everything that his people need. He took that offering. He blessed it. He broke it and he gave it out. And everyone had their fill. They were satisfied. It wasn't like everyone took a little crumb and was like, <laughs> I'm full. <laughs> No, they had enough to eat. And if they wanted seconds or thirds or fourths or however much they needed, they were satisfied. They were filled. And after everyone was satisfied and full, they went about and they picked up 12 wicker baskets. And in scriptures, we know that numbers have a significance. We know seven. What is seven? Seven is the number for perfection, right? Twelve. What is twelve? How many, how many apostles did the Lord have? How many tribes of Israel did the Lord have? How many mason jars were filled at the purification rites? No, I don't, I don't know how many there were. I was, I was just seeing who was, who was going to follow me on that train. But 12 is the significance of everyone. So in the 12 tribes of Israel, it gathered all of the Lord's people and the 12 tribes of Israel, it mentioned that everyone was there and they were blessed by the Lord. They were his people and he would continue to provide for them. And so in these 12 wicker baskets that were filled, it meant that everyone would have had enough to eat again if they desired. That again, the Lord could have fed the multitude. 
because he desired to care for his people. And he doesn't desire just to care for us just for enough, to let you have a little piece of bread and that's it, but enough to give you enough that you are satisfied and you are not hungry anymore. And then if you are still hungry, there is enough for you to go and eat where you will never be hungry again. Because the Lord doesn't bless us with just a little bit. He doesn't say, here, you can have this little eighth of a blessing. But he says, I'm going to pour out to you the fullness of the font of grace upon you. Because that's how deserving we are. Not that because we deserve it, because we have been called sons and daughters of God. Nothing we ever do will be able to merit that grace. But because we have, been beco- we have become sons and daughters of God in baptism, the Lord, he looks at us and he sees his son. The Lord, he looks at us and he sees his children who his son has offered his entire life so that we can be with the Father in heaven for eternity. The Lord, he looks at us and he remembers, you are my people. I will always give you what you need and I will always satisfy your hunger. Whether it's your physical hunger, whether it's your spiritual hunger, whether it is a hunger for justice, whether it's a hunger for mercy, I am who am. That same promise that the Lord made to Moses, that I am who I am, and I will be with you, and I will guide you, and I will lead your people. I will strengthen you, and I will nourish you. I will give you everything that you need, but you need to trust in me. That came to fulfillment when the Lord had called his people, and he had said, I will feed you. I will give you what you need to be able to continue to follow me on this journey of faith. And so as we are experiencing the very gift of the feeding of the multitude, we read through that and we think, oh my gosh, it's incredible. It's amazing how the Lord gave so much of himself to be able to show his glory. But it wasn't because of his own initiation. Well, it was. But also he knew what he was going to do. He knew that he was going to take the offering of the people. He knew that he was going to take that which was offered to him. He was going to bless it. It was going to be broken and it was to be given to all and that all would be satisfied. And that leads us to the very gift of the institution of the Eucharist. So in all four different gospel accounts, well, excuse me, three out of the four, we have the institution narrative where the Lord is surrounded among his disciples and the apostles and the upper room. And the Lord, he tells them, take this all of you and eat of it, for this is my body. This is the cup of my blood, the blood of the new and everlasting covenant. When the Lord is there looking at his apostles and his disciples in that upper room as he's instituting the sacrament of his own body, he is telling them that I will forever be with you. My presence will never leave you. I am giving you something more than just the bread from heaven that fed the Israelites and they died. But instead, I am giving you my very body to eat as food. I am giving you my blood that is true drink. I will be with you forever. I will be that nourishment for your souls. I will be that physical nourishment for your body. And there you will be led to that eternal place in heaven with me. And so at the institution of the Eucharist, there at the very end of the Gospels, we see how the Lord is telling his people, I'm going to give you so much better of a gift than Moses had ever articulated to the people that the Lord was going to give them this bread from heaven and that it would be enough just to satisfy them for that day. And then we hear that the Lord had given them that food from heaven, that bread, that multitude that had been broken, blessed, and magnified so that everyone was able to eat and be satisfied. Because then a couple of chapters later, we see that there's the feeding of the 7,000, where again the Lord had taken the offerings of the people, and there he had fed a multitude more. And then he tells them, a lot of you are following me because I've given you food. A lot of you think that I'm a walking McDonald's, able just giving you food wherever I go. That's not an original joke. I'm sorry. I stole that one. 
But the Lord, he's telling his people, listen, I'm feeding you food. Yes, I know that. But also there's something deeper at play here. Well, yes, I am providing for your bodily needs and you are hungry. This food is meant to be a nourishment for your souls and your bodies that you will continue to follow me. Not because I feed you, but because you know that I am the Lord. And so at the very end of John chapter 6, in the Bread of Life discourse, we hear that the Lord tells us, you must eat of the flesh of the Son of Man or you will have no life within you. You must drink the blood of the Son of Man or you will have no life within you. For my flesh is true food and my blood is true drink. And if you do not take of my flesh or drink of my blood, you will have no life within you. And we hear that the Jews, they say, this is a hard teaching. How can we accept this? How can we eat the flesh of another man? And how can we drink his blood? Because in the, Israel, in the, in the law of Moses, if you were to touch the blood, if you were to touch the zoe, the life force of a person, you would then have become ritually unclean. And you would have to go through the proper purification rites to then be able to enter into the temple, to be able to enter into the place of worship. You were not able to eat the flesh of man, for then you would be unclean. And so the Lord, he's telling them, unless you eat of my flesh and drink of my blood, the people are like, what is happening? What's going on? It goes against everything that we know in our law. But the Lord is telling them, no. Because the law was made so that way you would come to know me, to worship me, and to love me. What I'm telling you now is that very deep way that you will come to know me, that you will be satisfied by my very bodily presence, and there you will be led to eternity. The Lord is telling his people in that very moment, trust me, know me, that I will forever feed you that very gift of my body. I will forever nourish you in a way that you have never been nourished again, because this nourishment will bring you to that life eternal. And so the Jews, they're, they're saying that this is a hard teaching. Because the Lord isn't saying, oh, it's just a symbol of my body. It's just a sign of my body. What's the problem here? No, that's not what's happening here. The Lord is saying, unless you feastos, unless you feast on the Son of Man, you will have no life within you. Unless you trogon, unless you gnaw, gnash, chew on the flesh of the Son of Man, you will have no life within you. The Lord is not mincing words here. He's not saying that it's merely a sign of my body. It's not merely just a symbol. He's saying, this is my body. And unless you chew upon it, unless you eat it, you will have no life. And we hear that the people go away sad because this is a hard teaching and they cannot accept it. And so part of the multitude that was following him, part of the multitude that had been following him, they left. And a lot of the times we hear in the parables, right? When the people didn't understand, the people, they would ask him, Lord, explain it to us. And the, when the people didn't understand, he would say, hold on, hold on. Let me re-explain it to you in a way that you might understand. That didn't happen at the end of John 6. Because there was no further explanation necessary. There was nothing to be misunderstood from what Jesus was saying. Jesus didn't follow that crowd that was leaving him and saying, hold on, wait, hold on, wait. It's a joke. It's different from what you think. No, he let them go away because that was the truth. Just like, just like Pharaoh, who had a hardened heart and wasn't able to understand. Their hearts may have been hardened, but there's hope. We hear that at the time of Pentecost, after the Lord had come about and as he had risen from the dead, after he had risen from the, 
from the dead, and as he had appeared in glory, we heard that a multitude of them had come and desired to be baptized. Some of those who had went away because that was a hard teaching may have been one of the first Christians that had come back to the Lord. Some biblical scholars happen to say that those who were following the Lord because he was giving them food to eat, some of them who have, may have left at the end of John 6 and they turned away because it was a hard teaching, the Lord may have drawn them back because they experienced the resurrection of his son. Some of them have, may have said, I understand what he was saying then. I understand it now because he has risen from the dead. I understand it now because what he is saying is truthful. And they may have been one of the first Christians that had went out and were baptized by the apostles. Those that had gone astray because it was a hard teaching may have been some of the first ones to come and say, I know that he was professing the truth. How many of those, when we hear in the Acts of the Apostles and at the very end of the Gospels, when those who had experienced the resurrection of the Lord, do we remember how many of those were baptized on the very first day? Three to 5,000, right? In different accounts. Three to 5,000. And then we hear throughout the rest of the Acts of the Apostles, and, and 1,000, and 3,000, and those that had come to faith were many because they had experienced the risen Lord. They had experienced the resurrection. And so, when the Lord, he was telling his people, this is my body and this is my blood. He was telling them, in truth, this is my flesh. It is given to you as a nourishment for your body. It is given to you as a nourishment for your soul. It is given you for that nourishment that will lead you to eternal life in heaven. And so as we get to that very encounter with the Lord, as he's experiencing the greatness of the institution of the Eucharist, where he's there with his apostles that are all gathered at table, and he's revealing to them the breaking of the bread. And he's telling them, take this, all of you, and eat of it. And then he takes the cup of blessing, filled with the fruit of the vine. He hands it to them and says, this is the cup of my blood. The blood of the new and everlasting covenant. When he is professing those words, he means it. Because when God speaks, creation follows. So at the very beginning in the foundation of the world, when God said there was light, what happened? There was light. When God said that the, that the sea teem with a multitude of water creatures, what happened? Teemed with water creatures. When the Lord said, let there be birds in the sky, birds in the sky, separating the foundations of the world from the waters, and it happened. When God speaks, creation follows. And so here, God, incarnate in the second person of the Blessed Trinity, when he speaks and says, this is my body, Creation has nothing else to do but to follow. And so that word that we heard last week, transubstantiation. Say it all together. Transubstantiation. Father Angelus was struggling a little bit last week towards the end of it. But it can be a challenging word to say, especially sometimes when we're just in conversation. But in that, in the very philosophical way, it says that the substance that is there, it maintains its accident, but it is completely transformed into a new substance. That's a very fancy way of saying that it is gonna be looking the same. It will taste the same, but it is wholly Jesus. Body, blood, soul, and divinity in the Eucharist. Because again, when the Lord speaks, creation follows. And so when the Lord is sitting there at table with his apostles, and when he's telling them, this is my body, and then he takes the chalice and he says, this is my blood, the Lord is leaving them the very sacrament of himself. And then he's telling them, do this in remembrance of me. Do this in those times that it is challenging. Do it in the times that it is difficult. Do it in the time that you feel that you cannot do anything else 
Because remember, the Lord satisfies. The Lord is the one who will lead and nourish his people and will provide everything that they will ever need. And the Lord, in a very perfect way, offers the greatest gift that he could ever give us, himself. And so then, as they're leaving that place where the Last Supper took place, where the institution of the priesthood and the institution of the Eucharist just took place, the Lord, he gets up from that table, he steps off to the side, and he begins his journey to the cross. And then he goes into the garden, and as he's praying, in his very high priestly prayer, he says, Father, I pray that they are one as you and I are one. The very mission of Jesus Christ was that to unite us, to show us who he is, to unite us, and then to give us a nourishment for our bodies and our souls, so that we will be led to that place of eternity in heaven. Because the Lord satisfies, he gives us everything that we'll ever need for the journey. When the Lord was about to enter into the very moment of his own suffering, he was thinking of us. Before the Lord took his first step, before he began to go to the garden to pray, before he began his journey to the cross, he gave us his very body, his blood, his soul and divinity in the Eucharist to nourish his people, to save his people, to be that food for the journey. And then he gets up from that table and he takes his first step that leads him to his crucifixion that will bring us to the resurrection. Christ Jesus, who offered everything, who has given us everything, left us his body, his blood, his soul and divinity as a nourishment for his people. We see that it kind of came in stages. That the Lord said, I will give you everything that you need, but you need to trust in me. Trust that I'm going to do this again for you tomorrow. I'm going to feed you, like I fed the 5,000. I'm going to give you enough food that you will be satisfied, and if you're hungry, you can still eat. I'm going to give you enough food that you will never be hungry. And then here at the institution of the Eucharist, I'm going to give you that food that will satisfy your hearts and your souls for eternity. I will give you that nourishment that will satisfy your soul so that you can be led to that place of eternity in heaven with me. I'm going to give you that nourishment that will nourish your body and soul so that it can join me for eternity in heaven. And you will never be spiritually hungry again. But yet we recognize that we are a little bit spiritually hungry sometimes. Sometimes we are a little bit spiritually hungry. Sometimes we feel that we're in a desolation and we are in the desert just like the Israelites were. Sometimes we feel that, yes, we may have encountered the Lord, but yet we're still missing something. And the Lord, he says, I'm going to still be there with you. I'm going to continue to give you that nourishment that has come from heaven, that is my body, my blood, my soul and divinity. So it'll be a nourishment for you because I will always be with you. I will always accompany you on this journey of faith. And I will always lead you to where I am calling you to go. And so the Lord, when he gives us that very gift of his body, when he gives us that very gift of his soul, blood, and divinity, the Lord offers us everything that he has to be a nourishment for us, to follow him, to love him, to serve him, and to know him. And so it kind of brings us to this next point. A lot of the times we may come to Mass, and when we say, let us pray, sometimes I don't know, when I, when I used to grow up, when the priest would say, let us pray, that's when I tuned out. Because I knew he was just going to start talking. <laughs> I'm being realistic. I'm being honest. So a lot of the times when I was growing up, when the priest said, let us pray, that's when I tuned out. And I was like, okay. And I knew when to sit down right after he stopped talking. I don't know about you, but maybe that might be our disposition. Sometimes when we think, let us pray, and, I start, and we might be thinking, okay, that's time for him to start praying. And I can sit here and I can watch. Instead, it is totally transformed and turned around. Because that let us pray is actually that. Let us as a community of faithful who are gathered here to celebrate the divinity of our Lord. We have come here to offer our prayer. 
We have come here to offer our worship to him who we know will save us. We have come here to offer the struggles of our life. We've come to offer those times of difficulty, those times of strife, those times of discord in the family, everything that we have to offer, and we can give it in that moment. All of our joys, all of the great moments in our life, we offer it in that moment. Because in that very calling, that's that first prayer that we say, let us pray. That's exactly what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to pray. Lord, this is what I have to offer you. Lord, this is my five loaves, and this is my two fish. It may not seem like a lot, but this is what I have to give you. And that's why a lot of the times you'll hear Father Angelus, Father Ben, and myself, after we say, let us pray, there's a pause. And it's not because we're looking for the page to find in the missal. It's not because we're lost and we're trying to figure out where we are. It's not because we're looking at whatever it is to look at. Instead, no, we're waiting because as a community of faithful, we're all supposed to be doing something. And that's pray. <laughs> so the next time we come to Mass this upcoming Sunday and the priest says, let us pray. That is your opportunity to offer your five loaves and your two fish. That is your opportunity to take all of the sufferings, the sacrifices, the joys, and everything that you are encountering in your life and to place it right there on that altar. That is your opportunity to offer those five loaves and those two fish that we think may not be enough, that it's not enough. And yet the Lord, we know what he does. He takes that offering, everything that we have to give him, and he takes that offering. He blesses it. He breaks it, and he gives it out to the world for the salvation of us and the salvation of others. The Lord takes that small gift that we offer to him, even if we think that it's not enough. Just as he took those loaves and the fish, and it fed the 5,000, your prayers, your small sacrifice that we can offer to the Lord may be that which will give grace to another person that we may never meet, in the world. There's a beautiful reflection that I heard. Here in our country, we experience religious freedom. Well, yes, it sometimes will come under attack. It's never as it is in some of the other countries that are here in the, in the world. I'm sure a lot of us can remember reading that on Easter, a church was bombed in the Middle East, and the group of Christians that were going to celebrate the resurrection of the Lord as a witness to him who has risen, were killed because they went to go celebrate the resurrection from the dead. They themselves lost their lives. For us, we kind of take it for granted. They were able to come and worship the Lord. They were able to come and offer him these very small sacrifices in our life because we will never sacrifice as much as those who did. I pray that we never have to encounter that kind of a great sacrifice to be able to pray, to be able to exercise our faith. But the Lord, he will take those offerings that we have. He will take that small offering, even if we think that it's not enough. He'll take it. He'll bless it. He'll break it open. And it will be given out for the salvation of the world. So when it comes time of that gift of the offering, when we stand there and say, pray, my brothers and sisters, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. At that time after, yes, there is the collection that takes place. <laughs> but also, there is that gift of the people. At times, I remember pre-COVID, a lot of the parish, they would do the presentation of the gifts. There'd be a saboria filled with the unconsecrated host. There was a cruet filled with wine. And the gift of the people that was brought forward from the midst of the people and was given to the priest at the altar. I think as a sign that yes, from the gifts of the people, just as the Lord did for the feeding of the 5,000, these gifts are brought from the people and are meant as a spiritual nourishment 
to care for our nourishing of our bodies and souls right here and right now. So Lord, you will always nourish us. He will always give us the very presence of himself. He has given us the greatest gift in the Eucharist, where he has given us his body, his blood, his soul, and divinity. And so when we think about how we particularly are able to live out that Eucharistic formula, how do we take the struggles of our life? How do we take the joys of our life, and how do we offer that to the Lord? At that very moment where we say, pray, my brothers and sisters, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. I pray that your offerings are there on that altar. I'm not talking about the monetary offerings. I'm talking about your spiritual offerings that are placed there on that altar to be blessed, transformed, and spread for the salvation of the world. That our family struggles, somebody who is sick and in need of prayer, somebody that we are offering this Mass for, somebody that we are able to pray for. If our gift isn't there, ready to be broken open, blessed, and given out into the world, what are we doing? And I say that with love, because the Lord, he invites us to his very presence. He invites us to offer him everything that we have. He invites us to offer the joys, the struggles, the highs and the lows of our life, and to be placed right there at the altar so that it is then broken, blessed, and given for the world. I don't know about you, but sometimes I still feel that the gifts that I have to offer are so small. But then I remember in that account of the gospel where in John that little boy came and he probably offered his lunch probably all that he ever had to give to Jesus. And he says, this is what I have to give you. This is all that I have to give you. I pray that each of us will have the faith of that little boy to be able to take whatever we have and to be able to offer it to the Lord. And that is how we can be a Eucharistic people. A Eucharistic people that are transformed by his body, by his blood, by his soul and divinity that is given to us in the Eucharist. And then at the very end of that, we're called to go out into the world. So after we have received communion, after we have received the Lord, then we're called, go in peace, glorifying the Lord by your life. It's a go. Go out from this place and be the Lord to the world. Go out from this place and be Christ to the world. Go out from this place and show the same love that we have received here to others that may not ever experience him or ever know him. And it's not that we have to go to other parts of the world. We can experience that in our neighbor two doors down from us. We can experience that in the person that annoys us the most at our job. We can experience that person who we may never know that they have never encountered the Lord ever in their life. And we can take that peace that we have received in the Eucharist and by the witness of our own lives, be Christ to that other person. We don't have to go very far to be a witness of Christ. We don't have to go across the world on a mission trip to go experience the glory of the gospel. That person who has never encountered Christ may be the person that sits two cubicles down from us. That person who has never encountered Christ might be that person that is waiting in line behind us at pavilion. That person who may never experience the greatness of Christ can be the person that is the closest to us. But because we have received his body, we have received his blood, his soul, and divinity, and has totally transformed our own hearts and souls, we can go out and be Christ to the world. That's one way that we can be a Eucharistic people. That's one way that the Lord calls us to be totally transformed and to be nourished, and from that nourishment to go out and to nourish the world around us. Part of the ways that we're going to be able to do that here in our diocese is actually from our Eucharistic Congress, Eucharistic Congress that is taking place. It's going to be October 20th through the 21st. It's called I Am. A recalling that as the Lord said, I am who am. When the Lord revealed his divine name to Moses, I am who am. 
I am the perfection that is all perfection. I am the perfection that will be perfect. I am the perfection that is already perfect. I am. I am is a qualifier that the Lord doesn't need anything after. When he says, I am, I am the perfection of justice. I am the perfection of mercy. I am the perfection of all things. I say I am, and you're waiting for me to finish the sentence. You're like, you're what? But when the Lord says, I am, he's revealing to himself who he is. Because he is the perfection of all things. And so when the Lord says, I am, there isn't a need to qualify it with anything else because it's the perfect way to describe him. And so in our Eucharistic Congress here in the Diocese of Orange, what we're going to be doing is we are going to come to the Lord, who is the great I am, who is the perfection of all things, who has given us his son in the Eucharist as a nourishment for our bodies and souls, who leads us to life eternal. So when the Lord says, I am, we can qualify it with whatever we like. I am the bread of life. I am the vine and you are the branches. I am the good shepherd. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am. And so we invite you to come October 20th to the 21st. Go ahead and pull out your phones right now. Block off those dates on your calendar. You are not going anywhere else because you're going to be at Christ Cathedral, right? Yes. Yes. Oh, is it really? Yes. Okay. Friday is youth? Okay. We're all young at heart. We can invite our young people, right, on the 20th? Okay. And so, as we conclude our night tonight, I want to thank you all for coming here. I want to thank you all for, take, for, for me to take this opportunity to explain how we can take that very gift of the Lord, that he has called us to be his people, that he remembers, that he nourishes, and that he strengthens. And then he will feed, that we were satisfied, and that we will never be hungry again. And then he gives us that very gift of his body, that we are nourished, and we are nourished for eternal life. And from that very nourishment, then we go out and transform the world around us, because we then allow ourselves to be taken. We are blessed, we are broken open, and we are then given out to the world so that our brothers and sisters may come to know Christ through us. Amen? Amen. Well, I know for Father Brandon, at least after coming here, this is his second year. This was the first time he had to do an... Do not interrupt. Oh, really? <laughs> this doesn't need to be in the camera, by the way. <laughs> I think, um, you know, since he came here, this is the first time he did an hour-long presentation, and I believe that was a great presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Father. I loved especially the way he developed the whole Eucharistic story, starting from creation, how God was actually planning from all eternity for this to happen for God's children that God always wanted to give himself completely to us. So from the time of Adam, God was preparing a people when it would be ready for the people to receive Jesus Christ, the eternal word of the Father. And in the Eucharist, we are able to receive that, that, that trine God every single time we come to Mass. So thank you for developing that so beautifully. And you did an amazing job. Good job. Our uh, priest vocation stories are oftentimes Eucharistic stories because a lot of us are drawn to priesthood because of our love for the Eucharist. So we continue our reflection on the Holy Eucharist next Thursday, but it will be connected with Father Brandon and our baby priest. Come on, let everybody see the baby there. <laughs> Father Ben, um, Father Brandon. Uh, Thomas, are you going to share your story too next Thursday? Do you have a story? 
you do uh, maybe half story. So it's not full yet. Um, I think what, what we are planning to do next Thursday is maybe Susan didn't ask you yet, right? Yeah. Thomas, no. All right. Well, you have one week to prepare. <laughs> You're speaking next Thursday. So this is what's going to happen next Thursday. You will hear the vocation stories of Father Brandon, how he got his call to priesthood. Um, Father Ben's vocation story, how he got his call to priesthood. And seminarian Thomas, if he's ready. <laughs> because we want it to be a good story, so make it, make it a good story, okay? <laughs> um, and then after they share their vocation story and how it is connected to the Holy Eucharist, then we could have kind of a panel discussion here where you get to ask questions, you know, interesting questions, challenging questions and they will give a uh, response. Is it good? Uh, me? You heard my stories too many times. And I, you know. And um, unfortunately, I won't be here. Um, I know. <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, but I will be watching. <laughs> Everything will be recorded, so... Just warning you. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be going to Chicago. Chicago, um, this Sunday, I have a conference there. And then uh, from Sunday through Sunday night, I, I leave. And then I come back Wednesday. But same day, I leave for Napa because we have the Napa conference in Napa. And I'll be back uh, before Sunday, uh, Saturday night, because I can't miss you all on Sunday. I want to see you Sunday. Um, but I'm pretty sure and I'm very confident, Father Brandon, Father Ben, and uh, we'll see if Thomas is ready. Um, if not, these two will do a good job, right? Yeah. So see you all, and they will see you all next week. So keep coming back. And this, I think this has been so far such a great, great experience for us. So let's continue next week. God bless you. Good night. We forgot to pray. I'm so sorry. Uh -oh. Hold on. Let's wait for the final blessing. <laughs> Good and gracious.